Discretionary listener participation is advised for the following pro wrestling podcast. Lord, I was born a rambling man. Listen to the Stick to Wrestling podcast as often as I can. I want to thank the Allman Brothers for writing that song about their favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling, where if you give us 60 minutes, Perhaps indeed, we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. This is the recognized symbol of excellence in podcast entertainment. Uh, before we get rolling, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. Just ask to get in and you're in. We talk wrestling. We have photos, results, uh, what to do if you're going to start working a late night shift, all kinds of fun stuff. Follow me on Twitter. Just search John McAdam and follow the guy who has the stick to wrestling logo in his avatar i hope everyone liked last week's show it was a little bit different i flew solo but i had like 15 more than 15 minutes of audio to keep you entertained with that i am going to bring on my guest jamie ward and we're going to talk about the world wrestling federation 40 years ago the autumn of 1982 jamie thank you for joining us once again and once again, it's my honor to be uh, asked to be on your fabulous podcast. Well, thank you, sir. One thing I want everyone to know coming in, uh, we whenever we do the WWF review, we have some audio. And I, once again, I've been living a lie. I thought I had all kinds of great audio lined up. The promos for the upcoming Madison Square Garden show. No, the person who I get this stuff from switched from the WOR Channel 9 to something called Sky Sports that – aired WWF wrestling in like 2000, 2001. They aired old stuff. So not as much audio as we're used to. It's a whole bunch of Buddy Rogers corner, but we'll get through it. Jamie, what what were your thoughts when you first saw Buddy Rogers doing Buddy Rogers corner uh, on on WWF TV 40 years ago? Well, at the time, it was a total shock for me because I was just starting to get the sheets. But the sheets weren't up to uh, the date as they much, as they became in the 80s and the 90s. And I had no idea that Buddy was going to be there. And just from all that I had read about the guy, I was ecstatic when I saw him walk out. Yeah, same here. I mean, he was a legend. He was a big name. He made his comeback uh, in late 1978 after being just, you know, after disappearing for well over 10 years, more like 15. And, you know, it was a big story. And I was glad to see him. But as, as time went on, like I wasn't exactly crazy about that segment, but I, I was glad to see him. Yeah, well, in the beginning, the whole snooker relationship and everything, because they had the relationship in uh, Mid Atlantic was two, three years uh, prior to this. So you got all excited about it. However, once you get into 83 and he just becomes a record manager, it's not as refreshing as it was when it first started. No, it wasn't. And yeah, uh, it's really, if you think about it, it's the original Piper's Pit. I mean, you know, they, no yeah, one it had just a became another, like that. It, it just became 10, well, it wasn't even 10 minutes. But it's probably five to seven minutes of, of TV just to uh, to kill. Yeah, Elmo. Well, you know what? Barbara Clary's Take Five might have been the original Piper's Pit. But anyway, if anyone knows something that predates that, please put it up on the Facebook group. But anyway, let's start with a little bit of audio. Uh, Bob Backling receives a trophy, I believe, after a tour of Japan. Let's go to that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this time... To make a special presentation, I would like to introduce you to wrestling great, Pat Patterson. Well, first of all, I'd like to say to all of you wrestling fans, this is one of the most beautiful trophies all the years that I've been in wrestling that was presented by the country of Japan to one of the most prestigious wrestlers in the world today because the wrestler that won this trophy won one of the most prestigious tournaments that took place in Japan. And I would like for you to help me to welcome this man that won the the tournament. And his name is none other but the world's champion, Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund, once again, congratulations. 
From what I heard, it was a very, very tough tournament, and I want to congratulate you. Oh, thank you very, very much, Dad. I appreciate that. And, uh, uh, the beautiful trophy and the Japanese press awarded this to the winner of the, the final match in the tournament. And uh, uh, I just want to thank the fans for their great support in Japan. They, uh, uh, they really uh, support me nicely, just like the fans all over the world do. And uh, I really love them for that. And, uh, you know, uh, the chicken wing got me this uh, trophy, and I want to keep going on that too, man, or uh, Patson. Thank you very much. Bob, thank you very much. All right, Bob Backman, shaking hands with the competitors in our next match. And look at the size of that trophy. That's one of the biggest trophies, and no doubt one of the most beautiful trophies ever, and certainly to a well-deserving individual. The winner of the, the most prestigious tournament in the country of Japan, Bob Backman. That wasn't too bad, Jamie. What would you think? Well, it gets Bob over as the world champion. Yeah, and we've got an interview coming up. Well, with Bob Backlund, that I was, it was kind of painful to get through through, but that one wasn't too bad. Uh, once again, I want to remind everyone: anytime we play audio, it is for review purposes only. Jamie, there, I'm glad I have you on because you are from the Philadelphia area. Um, in 1980, now let me take a step back. Superstar Billy Graham is the lead heel coming into the fall of 1982. In 1981, there was a column written by Gorilla Monsoon in, the, I believe it was the Philadelphia Inquirer, where he talked about superstar Billy Graham had died. It was the headline of the column. Did you see the column? Did people you know who were wrestling fans see the column? And what was your reaction to it? Yeah, not to correct you, but it was in the Philadelphia Journal. Thank you. Yeah, that was an upstart newspaper that started in late 78. And by early 79, uh, they gave Gorilla Monsoon his own um, own article in there every week. I uh, started out on Tuesdays and it ended up coming out on every Thursday. And I guess it lasted well into like 1983. And each week he'd have different little, you know, tidbits. And he would talk about other uh, promotions out there. He talked about, uh, there's one that he did about Puerto Rico and how he was uh, wrestling in Puerto Rico part-time. And then this one time, here was the uh, the article that said superstar Billy Graham had passed away. And, you know, he sends his condolences and everything to the uh, to the family. Now, there was a story that I've heard. I want you, I don't know if you know anything about this. Supposedly, the Superstar Billy Graham versus Bob Backlund matches in 1982 drew poorly in Philadelphia because the fans thought the promotion had pushed a fake Superstar Billy Graham out there. You were right there in Philly, Jamie. What Can you shed some light on this? Well, not to correct you again, John, but they never wrestled in Philadelphia. Oh, well, then, I guess we have an yeah, explanation. No, they, uh, he, he wrestled Pedro in Philadelphia, had a few there with him, but he never got a title shot at the Spectrum. Okay, wow, that's, I guess I... They saved you. that strictly for MSG and some of the other arenas. What At the time he was getting the shots in MSG, uh, back when was facing uh, Buddy Rose Okay, at the Spectrum. And that didn't wrap up until November. No, and you, you know what? Thank you for correcting me. I want the correct information out there. Was there a buzz that there was a fake superstar Billy Graham that the WWF was using? Yeah, that was uh, a thing that I was reading in the newsletters at the time. And even uh, some of my friends that followed wrestling, not as, as heavy as I did at the time, uh, they would, you know, tell me, oh, that's not the real superstar. He doesn't have the, the long blonde hair and the, the body's not as ripped as it was. But it really was uh, uh, Billy Graham. No, I, I never thought it wasn't superstar Billy Graham because I had seen in the magazines in 1980 that he had shaved his head. And, you know, I mean, what can I say? He wasn't as big as he used to be. And I, I noticed. But at the same time, well, I mean, he might have just been training differently. Yeah, and he was going with the full beard there. He didn't have the uh, the little porn stash that he had when he came back in 82. That is correct. All right, now, 
I looked very hard for this audio. I was not. I don't have it. I was not able to find it anywhere. Uh, Bob Backlund, superstar Billy Graham, came out and he destroyed the WWF Championship belt. And Jamie, what was what was your reaction to that angle? Bob Backlund was wrestling Swede Hansen, and Graham comes out and just destroys the belt. Right. You, you could hear Graham saying. If I can't have the belt, nobody's going to have the belt, and he destroys it. I actually thought it was a great angle until uh, on Bob the, Backlund gets outside. Yeah, and gets you, the belt. We, we actually, and it was all downhill from there. Yeah, Jamie and I lived through this, and I, I do want to talk about it because you know he and I lived the same experience. But we actually have audio of the match where the belt was destroyed. Let's hear that. I can't believe what superstar Billy Graham is doing. He's tearing the belt apart. He is ripping it apart of that gold belt. What do you think ago, you're doing? Go back to your head this belt. Nobody can have it. What do you think you're doing? I can't believe what this man is doing. First he said it's his, now he's destroying it. Jamie, let's have some fun. I will impersonate Vince McMahon, and then you get to impersonate Bob Backlund, okay? Ah, What what are you doing? Ah, What are you doing? Why? Why? (laughs) That's my thing. Why? Bob Backlund. And we were talking about the Buddy Rogers corner, which we can't find. It was way worse on Buddy Rogers. He was doing the same thing, the same crying. Well, you know, that that it was the only way... That his grandmother knew he was a champion was that he would bring that belt when he visit grandma and she would hold the belt. And that way she knew Bob was a champion. How is she going to know now? Bob doesn't have a belt. I, one of the, I've told the story on the show before. One of the funniest moments of my life, we're sitting there watching it. And a, and a, a guy who was kind of a non-fan is like, what is she deaf to? <laughs> I mean, it was this. Jamie, I know that in Boston, really in Nashville, New Hampshire, with you know the people I watch wrestling with, people I talk about wrestling with, this was a wrecking ball for Bob Backlund. He was just not seen the same way again. He had enough, a big enough problem on his hands with the upcoming explosion of Jimmy Snooker's popularity, and. Then he throws this hand grenade in the middle of it. Yeah, and this was, even if you want to go back a couple years, uh, the way he cried after Peter Maivea turned on him, this is a hundred times turned up. You're correct. 
and, and and like you're saying, the the snooker back on matches, you could hear the snooker crowd starting to get more cheers than back on was in those matches. And then this just sent back on, you know, if he was a hundred hundred percent the champ in the people's eyes, this started the downfall. This really started the downfall of Bob Backlund. And he managed to hold the title for another like 15, 16 months after this happened. But uh, I mean, really, there was a I noticed uh, when I, I I was going to all of the Boston Garden shows at this point every four or five weeks. And there was a definite shift in the crowd's reaction towards Bob Backlund before this. He was getting no, let me let me change that. Before Snuka, he was getting close to 100% of the cheers. Then Snuka comes in. It's not quite 50-50. It's probably like 66-34. But now the crowd... Right, good analogy, yes. Yeah, and now the crowd is starting to cheer for superstar Billy Graham a little bit. 83 comes around. Morocco's getting cheered a little bit. Slaughter's getting cheered a little bit. You know, it, it, And I think that made a big difference. Oh, it, it sure did. It was just, I do you know who booked that? I, I I've never heard whether that was a monsoon idea, if Patterson had influence by that point, or was this strictly Vince because uh, Vince takes over in August of eighty two, and starting with this September TV uh, taping, you have four or five straight TV tapings that have a major angle involved with it. I, I have the feeling Vince was... Which involved. they never did before. They, they never did it. Or I shouldn't say they never do angles. Very rarely did WWF ever do angles. Two or three a year. And you're you're going to have a stretch of five months in a row. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're right. The WWF was very slow-paced. And when Vince took over... I, did, I didn't know Vince had taken over when I was watching in 82, but there were some subtle changes going on as far as the production. They changed the ropes from all silver rope to a red, white, and blue rope going downward. They had a graphic with the wrestler's name when the wrestler was introduced. And I think this was another one of those changes that Vince wanted a new championship belt like that. That belt, it was a great belt, but it had been around for about 10 years, and sometimes you just need to change it. Even as a kid, I was 17 years old watching this. I'm like, okay, they wanted to upgrade the belt. Right. And that, that belt goes back to Morales, and if you really think about it, the um, up until Fuji and Saito, the tag team belts looked almost exactly the same as the championship belt. Yes, they did. They I, they looked exact. They did look exactly the cha- the same. And I I noticed that when I first started watching. I'm like, you know, why do the executioners have the same belt as Bruno Sammartino? Yeah, so I, I guess that's what it was. Vince wanted to put his fingerprint on it, and uh, if he was the one that picked that new belt, he sure picked an ugly one. But that's one we'll get to down the line. All right. I, you know what? I didn't mind that belt, but you're right. We can get to it as time goes on. Now, there was another major change in WWF programming. Uh, we talked a little bit about Buddy Rogers. Buddy Rogers makes his return to the WWF and gets a weekly talk segment called Buddy Rogers Corner. Uh, let's go to the very first Buddy Rogers Corner now. Thank you very much, Pat Patterson. And ladies and gentlemen, here with us, the gentleman who was introduced, of course, earlier on, who got a standing ovation, who looked just as good today as he did the day he won the championship. Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. Thank you, Vince. This, of course, is going to be a regular feature, as we outlined earlier, on our program. And I'd like to read to you, if I may, a disclaimer that the producers of the show see fit to have read before every Rogers Corner. And it reads, the views expressed in Rogers Corner are those of Mr. Rogers alone and not necessarily those of Championship Wrestling or the station. Obviously, Buddy, what they are anticipating is a rather controversial segment, and I'm sure they will not be disappointed. Well, I would like to say, Vince, that a great announcer in the world today says, tell it like it is. Well, on this program, I'm going to name it like it is. I'm going to call the shots the way they are. And another thing, whether they like it or dislike it, they're going to get 101% the truth. Well, no doubt, your career, of course, long and illustrious as anyone's, if not longer, and more illustrious than anyone's in professional wrestling. 
surrounded by charisma, color, and controversy as well. And already the first week here that we see Buddy Rogers, we see you entering the ring, introduced, and already controversy, Lou Albano refusing to shake your hand, and Superfly Snooker shaking your hand. And that, I'm sure, astounded a lot of people. Well, I believe the audience here nearly answered what I wanted, but I would like to put across this. When it comes to Lou Albano, I always feel in the battle of wit, he's unarmed. But I would like to say Jimmy Snooker, in my estimation, is the greatest wrestler in the world today and also the most misused wrestler in the world today. Well, the uh, most interesting, as we said before, Snooker shaking your hand, of course, uh, I'm sure it was a, a privilege for him to do so. It should be a privilege for anyone to do so. Uh, Snooker being mismanaged. Let me intervene there. It was also a pleasure for me to shake hands with Jimmy Snooker. I feel that this guy is the greatest talent in the world today. I hope I can be a part of proving that situation someday, some way. This is not the first time then that you have met Mr. Snooker. No, I previously met Snooker. I feel that Snooker has been sort of not hypnotized, but just taken and misused and mis he's just been abu totally abused but let me tell you something i've got in my heart and mind that all good things come back and i grant you i'll work till my dying day but i will see someday jimmy snooker hand to hand with buddy rogers i i guarantee well as we said before uh, we're going to expect uh, controversy we're going to expect uh, the unexpected, and I'm sure we're going to have it every week right here in Rogers Corner, and thank you for allowing me to be your first guest. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vince. My pleasure. All thank right. you, ladies and gentlemen. Buddy Rogers will be back with more pro wrestling action in a moment. Well, Jamie, first of all, clearly Buddy Rogers Corner was so edgy that they had to read that disclaimer every single week. Yes, every single week, just in case Buddy said something that would have set the uh the wrestling world of fire and and make people falsely think that the world wrestling federation these were their views and not buddy rogers right exactly jamie there was a match i i, I think it it didn't take place in the fall of two, 1982 it, i think it happened in well before september 21st it was at the spectrum it was bob backland against jimmy snooker with sd jones as special guest referee have you seen that match and if so what did you think of it oh yeah i, I saw the match live on prism that night and it, it was a very good match and once again the face referee screws the heel because back when covers Snooker, Snooker's legs on the outside of the outside the ropes, but SD makes the three count anyway. Yeah, and he's, I'm I'm glad we disagree on some things because I did not like that match at all. I, I it's uh, to me it's like okay, this is why babyface matches tend not to work. But I, I do remember that finish, and you know I didn't see it live. I saw it like four years, four or five years later, and so it's like oh okay, the ref screwed up. I'll just shake Bob Backlund's hand anyway. I thought that would that looked a little bit messed up. Yeah, well, that was the foreshadowing for what was going to. Uh happen in a couple more weeks yes because at that point snooker was as you were just saying the cheers were 60 40 in back on's favor but the fans were really behind snooker on the way to the you could see stevie wonder could see what was coming at that at that point and you know i really have to go back and rewatch this match because to take it back a moment billy graham rips the belt apart on the TV taping on um, September 14th, and this is this match occurs on September 18th. I need to look to see if Backlund had the belt when he entered the ring for this match. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I will check that out myself. I do have that. You know, because back then things really didn't happen unless they happened on TV. Exactly, and and but you know, what are you going to do? Put the belt back together? That's a really good point. Maybe pull the <laughs> dust off one of the tag old tag team titles. Or, or do what Mick Foley did with the uh, with that belt the Rock destroyed years later, and that's how he became the hardcore champ, where he got the crazy glue and put it all back together again. I like that. And, you know, when they aired that Buddy Rogers corner, I mean, once again, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Stevie Wonder. I don't see what's coming usually, but I immediately put it all together. Like, okay, this is going to – pretty soon this is going to be – Buddy Rogers and ba- and Jimmy Snuka versus Lou Albano and Ray Stevens or whoever else Lou Albano was managing. I mean, I I picked up on that right away. I mean, people like us because we were the everyday fan, and we we were even at at that point kind of like the hardcore fan of the day. Yes, I mean, we didn't have all that extra knowledge, but we watched everything we could get our hands on. Uh, where people like I watched re- a lot of wrestling with my parents. When I was growing up, my dad didn't see this coming, the, the whole Jimmy Snuka turn. And he knew nothing about Snuka and Buddy Rogers past or anything. So him as Joe fan didn't see this coming and really enjoyed the ride. Yeah, I sometimes I wish being that way. But I mean, you, you know, you I, I'd been watching WWF wrestling for over six years. And I was able to pick up certain patterns, you know, and and that's what I immediately Buddy Rogers comes on, talks about how great Jimmy Snuka is, how Albano sucks. And I'm like, OK, we have a, a new player on this television show. Yeah. And uh, also around this time, on, on a side note, Philadelphia had a sports talk show every night from six to eight on a station called WWDB. And the host was Rod Luck, who um, well, jumped around the nation a lot for a local newscast. And he ended up on WWDB doing the sports thing. And in late 82, he started, uh, you, did you ever go to the ribbit with us? I never went with Dennis Carluzzo. You guys, I don't know how that happened, but it never happened. I don't think. I mean, I might have. I, I don't remember. Okay. Well, anyway, I think this is why Dennis started going there was because Rod Luck every Thursday night would broadcast live from the Ribbit, and he would have WWF wrestlers on. And right around this, right after the, the entire angle takes place, he gets Buddy Rogers on his show. He gets Rocky Johnson on his show. He gets Gorilla Monsoon on his show. And for a solid two to three years, he was getting WWF wrestlers every Thursday night. Oh, wow. We didn't have anything like that. That's great. Yeah, they would come in for and do like a half hour to an hour. And um, they, I remember him having Albano on and Blassie and The Wiz and... And the bad guys would go at it with the people that happened to be at the bar. And, the, you know, the good guys would say everything that, would, you know, they're supposed to say. And it, it was always an you know, entertaining segment. Wow. That, that, um, that is fantastic. You got you had something like that. We didn't have anything like that. And I'm getting. Yeah, I even had I had some tapes and I gave them to a guy named Richard Vicek out in uh, Chicago because he was my original uh, tape person. He contacted me. He used to loan me all kind of tapes. He'd, he'd mail them to me and I'd mail them back. Uh, he wrote the Dick the Bruiser book, yeah. as a matter of fact. And then uh, he was on a 605 and he actually ended up playing some of the tapes that uh, I gave him. So Brian Lass has used them on 605. Cassette tapes. Talk about uh, cave Yes, cassette up. Cassette tapes on my little uh, c- cassette recorder where, you know, you hook up the microphone to with the little stand and put it right in front of the radio. Well, e- even even I was more sophisticated than that. I could record stuff on the radio directly. But anyway, uh, one thing that happened in the WWF in fall of 82, the debut of someone that I read about in the magazines, Eddie Gilbert, comes in as a mid-card baby face. Jamie, A, what did you think of Eddie Gilbert in 1982 when you first saw him? And B, how surprised were you when you found out that's not what Eddie Gilbert – Eddie Gilbert is not his WWF 1982 in per, persona in real life? <laughs> um, getting this – you know, to actually get to know Eddie you know, six, eight years later – that 1982 persona was a t- 
totally different person than the Eddie Gilbert that I knew. But when he first came in, I, I knew about him from the magazines. Uh, I knew he was Tommy Gilbert's son, and actually Vince says that when he makes his debut. And, you know, he got a, a decent push in the WWF overall. I mean, he, he ends up uh, forming a good team with Kurt Hennig. And then there's some other stuff that we'll probably get to in, in a little bit that really elevated him to that kind of little above mid-card. But uh, I, I enjoy his time there. I, I, you see, I was different. I looked at this guy and I'm like, okay, you know, here's this, you know, I just didn't, at, at 17, as a 17 year old, I just did not enjoy his persona. But then again, at this point in my life, I'm almost 100% in the heels corner. So I just thought it was cool. Here's somebody I knew from the magazines that found his way to the WWF that I would have never thought would have showed up. No, he didn't seem like a WWF type at all. I mean, I saw him uh, on WTBS a couple of times, but that was it until th- until this point. Right, yeah, and I, I'd only seen him through uh, through tape with some of his Memphis stuff and some of the uh, Pensacola stuff. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, let's talk about the WWF show that took place at Madison Square Garden, October fourth, nineteen eighty-two. And we don't, we don't have to talk about every match, but the Strongbows against Saito and Fuji, best two out of three fall match. Fuji and Saito win by lose by disqualification, so the belts do not change hands. Jamie, when I've said this before, we talked about this on the summer show when Fuji and Saito first started going at it with the Strongbows. It was white hot. The Strongbows were white hot. And for me, by by October 4th, 1982, I'm like, n- I was like, not this again. No, I, it, they should have, they, they should have just let the Strongbows keep the belt the first time. Yeah. I, I don't know if Putsky screwed up when he made that three count and it wasn't exactly supposed to happen back in, uh, in July or what the, you know what the deal was, but once Fuji and Saito regained the belts, Jay and Jules were to broke you to me. They were why? Yeah, just, just let them move along. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think that that they had so much momentum, and the WWF booked them wrong, and it, that momentum died quickly. I I think the Putski thing was all part of the plan. I think that they were going with the old pro wrestling saying that the the money is in the chase and no you know you didn't have hulk hogan chase the wwf championship about 15 months later you know in this case you put the titles on the strong bows and start feeding them heels and they didn't do it yeah because there was enough talent there to even make shift tag teams that, w- that would have worked that they could have defended the titles against until the samoans eventually arrived yeah, I, 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 you know, I mean, I, I would have done it completely differently. And like I said, when, when they took the titles off the Strongbows and put them back on Fuji and Saito, just killed all the momentum. The main event for this show, which was not televised, Superstar Billy Graham defeats Bob Backlund by a disqualification. I mean, a classic WWF way of we're not going to settle this in just one match. We're going to have two or three matches with a top guy or at least someone who is still a top name in Superstar Billy Graham. Right, and that's probably why they didn't televise this card because they wanted to make sure they sold it out. With this being, in the New York perspective, finally Billy Graham has come back to try to reclaim his belt. I mean, you look past the whole ju- judo Billy Graham thing. This is still Billy Graham, who was bigger than life in New York City in 77 and 78. He definitely was. And, you know, like you said, it, it's okay. He looks different, but it's still him. I, I, I never liked the whole judo thing, but Again, it was him. It was superstar Billy Graham. The guy was the W. He beat Bruno Sammartino and defended that title for over a year. Right. Under beat it. Dusty Rhodes, beat Mil Mascaris, and Peter Maive, and Jay Strombo, and Ivan Putski, who were all top guys at the time. So it, it pushed him way up there. And when, you know, Backlund won the belt, you had to give Backlund the respect because he built beat Graham, or at least that was probably Senior's vision of, of when Backlund got the belt. I mean, I, I've 
been hearing, you know, ever since I started conversing people, uh, conversing with people on the internet, and it's been over 25 years now, you know, oh my God, Kung Fu superstar Billy Graham, how did you manage to like that? It's like, again, I, I, I bought the name brand, but anyway, I learned recently that Bob Backlund, right around this time, toured Florida and defended the WWF Championship against both King Tonga one of the Islanders tag team and gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. Like I'm just sitting there going, wow, there was Bob Backlund defending against Jimmy Garvin in Florida. Yeah. And back during that time, we had no idea anything like that was going on. No, we had no idea whatsoever. I'm not going to play the audio for this, but the big turn happens. Uh, Jimmy Snooker. Well, he actually, I'll pl- we'll play the Buddy Rogers corner from before, right before this happens. Uh, Jimmy Snooker fires Captain Lou Albano, and then he has a match with Ray Stevens. But I'll tell you what, before we discuss that let's go to the buddy rogers corner where uh, buddy rogers basically just like puts a big split between lou albano and jimmy snooker which we at by this point we all knew it was coming if we could hear that well that's certainly a lot to unpack there a is no contract b you are a free man c your money is gone four i'd like you to manage me buddy and buddy five needs to think about this that was a lot, <laughs> but it was very, but, 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 but it was very effective. I, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, Albano was priceless in, in Albano, this scene here. Albano was absolutely great. You're a liar, liar. And then, you know, that, that's it. You're just a liar, man. <laughs> and if I'm Snooker, I'm like, okay, time out. What do you mean my money is gone? What does that mean? Right, I'd, I'd be a little, uh, a little pissed off, and probably would have attacked Albano right there. They didn't have to pull, pull me off of him. I, I'd be like, now, Lou, is this true? Is my money gone? What, what you, where's my money? How much of it is there? <laughs> I, like I said, just a lot to unpack. Oh, you, I have no contract. Okay. Did you think Snuka messed that up when he asked? Uh, Rogers to be his manager. You know, that's a really good point, and I have no idea. You're you're absolutely right. Snooker could have been just, you know, throwing spaghetti around, but he's like, ah, what do I do here? Right, and he just says, oh, well, I'll have to get back to you on that. I mean, in the, the, the perfect world, it, it would have led right into that, but it, it was just too much too quick. So I'm thinking that, that Snooker just went uh, not so much off script, but just out of nowhere came up with that yeah i I, that's a that's i've never thought about that before and that's a real possibility now obviously we have the big turn snooker fires albano ray stevens who is being co-managed by captain lou albano and fred blassie uh pile drives jimmy snooker twice outside the ring and jimmy snooker is stretchered out i should have talked about this a little bit earlier the week before they announced that jimmy snooker will be wrestling ray stevens on next week's show with no build-up or anything like that they never did heel versus heel matches so obviously they're they're not really out to surprise anyone here no it was actually another stevie wonder moment but you still got excited that two heels were going to go at it on tv and they hadn't announced that whole thing with albano as the co-manager of Stevens at this point. That doesn't happen until after Okay. After the match. Th- then it comes out that he uses all... I, I don't know if you're going to want to play this or not, so I'm sorry if I spoil it. Uh, that it was actually all Snooker's money that Albano paid Blassie to bring Stevens into the WWF. All right, that that makes sense. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, y- you know, yeah. I mean, the week before, you're like, okay, something big is going to go down next week, and it was actually a little bit bigger than I figured with with Jimmy Snuka being injured, and getting bloody. He really got bloodied up on that angle. Oh yeah, that was probably the the biggest blade job they had on TV since uh, Sabisco and Bruno. Yeah. They didn't use blood on TV very often, and when they did, they used a lot of it. I had a fun weekend, the weekend of October 9th and 10th, 1982, or at least I thought I was going to have a good weekend. The Boston Garden, the WWF returned to the Boston Garden on October the 9th, and it was Battle Royal Night, and I had not yet figured out what a disaster Battle Royal Night is. 
Andre the Giant wins the Battle Royal, and they don't even have – they had Bob Backlund against Buddy Rose, which was a good match. And those are like the only two interesting matches of the entire night. We had Baron Mikel Cicluna against Mac Rivera, Kurt Henning against Mr. X. Pedro Morales defends the Intercontinental Championship against the mighty challenge of Charlie Fulton, who hadn't won a match on TV in a year. Superstar Billy Graham against Ivan Putski, which would have been... Right, which is actually, for an old-school Boston fan at the time, you know, that's a former feud that has to speak, uh, spark a little interest for those that were live. I, yeah, I was, me and my friends talked about, wow, this would have been the main event uh, five years ago. Here's what they did in Battle Royal Night. They said, okay, we're having a championship match, Bob Backlund against Buddy Rose, and then we're having a Battle Royal, and then the the promoter's going to be scrambling to put together matches. So we didn't know we were going to see any of these matches beforehand except for Backlund and Rose. And yeah, you know, right. Graham and Putski didn't set the world on fire, but there were two guys we saw as stars. Yeah, exactly. I always enjoyed the uh, the Battle Royals when they were going to get the title shot later in the night. Though I thought those were better. At least they had some intrigue. But you know, again, if you figured out Battle Royal Night, you know you're going to get a, a lousy card after that regard. Oh, yeah, so, yeah that, that went with it, though. That was the bad part about and it. And I, I didn't so know that just coming saying. in, that they were going to put together matches like Mr. Fuji and Pete Sanchez, Mr. Saido and Frank Williams, Andre the Giant against Sweet Hans, who's not getting pushed, and Tony Gurria over the White Angel. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you again. I have that in my notes here. Who did we say the White Angel was? It might have been Don Serrano. Okay. I thought it, for some reason, I thought it was Jose Estrada. But I remember we went over this last time, and uh, I just totally forgot who we uh, said it was. Yeah. You know what? I I think I have the White Angel on a DVD someplace, and I'll take a look at it. It might have been Jose Estrada, but for some reason, I thought it was Don. No, you know what? Don Serrano was the Black Demon. So, <laughs> although at this point, they're saying that he, the Black Demon was uh, I for who was the Black Demon? Charlie he, Fulton, Baron Cicluna. He, you go down every job or was the Black de- Demon at one point. No, that was the that was the the Executioner in that big blue suit. Remember that guy? No, but in the black suit, they, they did the same same gimmick all during '83. Did they? All right. <laughs> I, I <laughs> my friends, I used to laugh. You know, at, at, but but no, you're right. They did did the executioner also, but then they followed it up with the black demon the following year. All right. No, I mean, my friends and I would be on TV, you know, watching it, laughing. And, you know, obviously, Baron Mikel Cicluna is the executioner today. <laughs> then the next night, right here in Nashua, New Hampshire, I I might have even walked to this show. Uh, we had a match. It was uh, the main matches were Superstar Billy Graham against Chief J Strongbow, and Ivan Putski defeats Buddy Rose. Uh, one was a countout, one was a DQ. We did not. But care. even for nostalgia purposes, Graham and Strongbow had. You know, a little feud back in 77. Yeah. And again, you know, this is the beauty of pro wrestling. Uh, Superstar Billy Graham and Chief J Strongbow and Ivan Putski, they come out to little Nashua, New Hampshire and uh, wrestle on a show in in the junior high school gym. Yeah, but you had also on that show that great match of Pete Doherty against Fred Marzino. It was so great, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> two, two local guy, guys, though. Pete was legitimately from Dorchester, and Marzino was from, well, Will- we're in Mass, was he? Uh, Stone of Mass, same as Nancy Carrick. Okay. All right. <laughs> then let me see. We have a another big show at the Philadelphia Spectrum, headlined by Playboy Buddy Rose defeating Bob Backlund via countout. Buddy Rose was a one and done against Bob Backlund pretty much everywhere but Philadelphia. You guys got two matches, and, and Buddy Rose could work. Very entertaining um, match that was with Rose and Backlund. Yeah, and we also have superstar Billy Graham uh, defe- defeating Pedro Morales by disqualification. For some reason, I automatically assumed that Graham was going to get a shot at Backlund in Philadelphia. But, uh, Jamie, you were right. He he did not. I figured this was part of the buildup. But, no, they never did it. No, they they only went Pedro and Graham. All right. Now we have— And, and I don't understand why, why they wouldn't have pulled the trigger in Philadelphia. 
on it. Maybe because of the Monsoon article. Very possible. And Monsoon never did apologize for that. No, he refused to, as a matter of fact. He he refused to write a retraction. And and he was still um, writing the article when Billy Graham came back. And he his whole explanation was, I got bad information. But he still never apologized. No, and, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, hey, I got bad information. Sorry about that, everybody. Sorry, superstar. You know, that, that Monsoon had an ego. What can I tell you? Yeah, he did. All right. Two big developments at the next big, at the next TV tape. Actually, three pretty big ones. Number one. Actually, can, just let me jump back real quick because it, it is kind of significant. Back on that October uh, 5th TV taping, along with the, uh, the Snooker deal, was not only the debut of Eddie Gilbert, but the debut of Rocky Johnson, which, if you fast forward years later, if he doesn't debut on that October 5th TV taping, the future of wrestling is shaped differently. Now, why is that? Because of his son. Ah, that's a really good point. Okay, I, I remember. So, if, if I mean, I guess he could have started at, at another TV taping, but that is the TV taping that, you know, Rocky gets over. On that first uh, TV taping. Yeah, Rocky definitely got over. And basically, as soon as those three weeks air of that TV, he's working house shows already. He's not taking two or three months off before he starts working house shows. He jumps right into it. What the WWF usually did was they would have a guy come in for one set of TV tapings and then three weeks later have him come in for another t set of tapings while he finished up wherever else he was working. And in this case, Rocky Johnson was working Portland. But, Jamie, this is news to me. I had, I had no idea they threw him right out on the road. Yeah, right out on the road. If you, if, if you if, like I do, I, when you tell me I'm coming on, I go immediately to that history of WWE. And I go over results for every single card during the time period that we're going to cover. That way, if something interesting just happens to pop into my eyes, I can bring it up. No, actually, and I appreciate that. Uh, this, now, l let me see. Ray Stevens uh, is now getting a big push with his opponents being stretchered out on the wrong end of the pile driver. So we know, you know, we know why they're doing this with Ray Stevens. He's going to have a series both against Bob Backlund and Jimmy Snuka. And what works with that is they admit that uh, Pat Patterson was his former partner, and he knows just how dangerous Ray Stevens is. So Patterson's always putting Stevens over on television. Yeah, he would talk about how he knew Ray Stevens very well and how they used to be a tag team. Finally, the, the Strongbows win the tag team titles. Uh, as I already stated, far too far too late. The, the feud w was had been over, but they kept putting the matches out there. Right. They win the tag team titles, and then on the same taping, it, it, I don't know if you're going there or not, John, but on the same taping, you knew who was going to be the next champions. Yeah, oh, <laughs> of course. Yeah, <laughs> as the Samoans debut on the same uh, TV tapings at... Jules and Jay win the belts. I mean, the WWF booked their tag team scene so poorly. You you knew as soon as Albano brought in a new tag team that they were winning the championships. And yeah, the Strongbows had just gotten the belts, and the Samoans are back, and we know exactly what's going to happen. Right. And you know who else shows up at this particular TV tape? And I don't mean to steal what you were going to say. Morocco's back. Morocco is back, and to me, that is the big, big story. I, I've mentioned this on the show before, but as soon as they say returning to the World Wrestling Federation, the one, the magnificent Morocco, and I'm like, I, I was elated. I, I don't want Bob Backlund to turn into my you know, new Ole Anderson. I guy smack around on TV all the time. I was so tired. <laughs> on TV on this podcast. I was so tired of Bob Backlund being champion. He had been champion since I was in seventh grade and I wanted something else. And I mean, I was Jamie, I was 100% convinced that Morocco was going to be the new world champion. He was going to get what superstar Billy Graham had gotten uh, five years previous. I really thought the same thing. Now the, the interesting part, of all this talent that is now starting to uh, to float in, 
not only did we just talk about they had major angles at five TV tapings in a row, but Vince must have been a big fan of Georgia Championship Wrestling because the Samoans were just there. Morocco was just there. And like you said, Eddie Gilbert had made an appearance there. And some more guys that are about to arrive in the next month or two, all during late 81 and 82, were on Georgia Championship Wrestling. So you can, Ray Stevens, he was on Georgia Championship Wrestling in late 81. So you can see that uh, Vince Jr. is now going after the stars that were already on cable to help take him into his next, uh, where he wanted to take the WWF to. I mean, it was a, a rare thing, and, you know, had I known about the business 40 years ago, the Samoans left Georgia as the national tag team champions with no notice. And Ole gets on TV, and he's like, well, they were afraid of Paul Orndorff and Tommy Rich, and wherever they're wrestling now, the wrestling must not be that good. You, the promoters did not do that to each other. You finished up before you switched territories. And I can't think of right. anyone who did that before the Samoans. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of like the, the, you know, the, the very early seeds of the war that was to come. Might've been, might've been the very first shot fired in that war. But now when Morocco comes back, they announce, oh, Morocco's coming back. I'm like, well, he's winning the title. I am ecstatic. And then I see him out there with Lou Albano. And I'm like, wait a minute, maybe not, because the Grand Wizard is the guy who manages the heel WWF champions, all all two of them, Superstar Billy Graham and Stan Stasiak. And as, as time went on, not like time as in weeks or months, but in years, I figured, wait a minute, that was probably even more of a clue that Morocco was going to win the title because Albano was the top manager and he'd never been the cha- uh, manager of the champion no, before. He, he, he had Ivan Koloff. Koloff. Yeah, Koloff for like three but weeks. But still, that was 10, that's. 10, 11 years before this. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, wow, maybe they're, you know, I, I pick up, up on this like 87, 88. Maybe they are, they are changing the pattern. And I should have thought, okay, now he's definitely winning the title, even though he never did. Yeah, I thought he was going to win the title, too. Matter of fact, when, um, what, a couple years ago when I was on and, and we still had Sean, the three of us went over that scenario, that fantasy scenario of Morocco winning the belt and being the, the champion up until WrestleMania when uh, Hogan takes it from him. That would have, I mean, that would have made a lot of sense, but you know, I'll talk a little bit about this either later or on next week's show. Business was still doing great with Backlund as champion. I, you know, I didn't know or take into consideration and I kind of figured that yeah, every, you know, everything's great in the WWF, no matter who the champion is. But like, like I said, we'll, we'll get more into that later. Um, we had a show in East Rutherford, New Jersey, at the Meadowlands Arena, right down the street from New York City. This is where Ray Stevens gets his title match against Bob Backlund, as opposed to Madison Square Garden. And they are protecting Stevens. He defeats Bob Backlund by disqualification. Yeah, that, um, that result... You know, surprised me. I remember the promotion for that show, and uh, it, it took me a couple months to find out exactly what happened. But yeah, you're right. They were protecting Stevens because Stevens still had to do his house show tour with Snook at some point. Exactly. Um, that you know, I understand why they wouldn't want to do something like that. You know, have Backlund go over clean, but. Then again, Bob Backlund never gets his win back in the New York area. WWF has another major show at the Boston Garden uh, this time. And once again, another fun weekend for me. Uh, This show is November 6, 1982. Main event, Bob Backlund defeats superstar Billy Graham in a Texas death match with Ivan Putski as the guest referee. Jamie, I remember this. Ivan Putski counted to three in probably less than one second. Which is a point I have written down in my notes here. If wrestling is legit, <laughs> and after the three the, the three count of the Fuji Saito Strongbow match, which was real fast with uh, the foot on the rope, why are you hiring Ivan Putski to be a referee again? Or a- especially when that 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 match was showed on that, that Strongbow match was showed on TV. Mm-hmm. 
So everybody saw it. I mean, I, again, I know it's four months later. The normal fan forgets about that. But if this was legit, I, I don't think that was the right referee for the job. If this was legit, Putski and, and Graham just fought in Boston last month. So why are you? Re- why? Are, oh, that, that's true too. Why are you relying on him to be a, a a fair referee when he and Graham had kind of a blood feud five years ago, and they 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 still don't like each other? It 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 never made sense. Yeah, but Billy does get a chance to get his revenge the next night, and you were probably there. I was there the next night in Nashua, New Hampshire. Same thing. And this was a weird thing, right? They have matches in Nashua four weeks apart. So we're thinking this is going to be a regular thing. No, they had exactly two shows. They drew really well and they just dropped it. But this time they just flip-flopped the opponents for uh, Chief J. Strongbow and Ivan Putski. This time Ray Stevens beats Strongbow in Nashua, and Ivan Putski beats superstar Billy Graham by disqualification. Got to make everything even once in a while. (laughs) Well, I mean, except that Ivan Putski won (laughs) twice and Strongbow lost twice. But at, at this point, Jamie, you know, Chief J. Strongbow... I mean, the the glitter was completely off of him. The shine was completely off of him. He was he was done, man. But at least he recognized it. I mean, going through the results, I do see, like, from here on out, that Jay's doing clean jobs. Yeah. I mean, yes, he does have his disqualification, but he is starting to do uh, clean jobs to other guys. That wraps up part one of the World Wrestling Federation Autumn 1982. I want to thank Jamie Ward for doing a great job, and he's going to be back next week for part two. Thank you all for listening. I want to thank Brian Last and the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network for giving me uh, this platform. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does producing this show. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We'll see you next week. This concludes our podcast day.